Welcome everybody on the Soapbox, as always. It is awesome seeing everyone here today. So the topic for today is, what is the will of God for my life? Every Christian has no doubt asked this question every, even many times in their Christian walk. So John, is this a question we can answer or should we not bother asking? Yeah, thanks, Candice, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I think it's probably one of those questions that every Christian will have asked at least once and no doubt multiple times as you go through your Christian life. You know, you're always thinking, or we, we should be always thinking, Lord, you know, what's what's the will of God for my life? So an answer to your question, is it a question that we should be bothering to ask? Is it a question we can find the answer to in scripture? Well, I believe um, it is, and we can. Bible says, for example, and just a, a few verses to lay the foundation for us looking at this. The first is in First John 2, verse 17, and it says, the world is passing away and its lust, but the one doing the will of God abides forever. So here we're told the person doing the will of God is going to abide forever. So there's a pretty good reason for wanting to know the will of God and actually being in the will of God. In Mark chapter 3, verses 34 to 35, Jesus looked about on those who were involved in his ministry, those who were in the little Bible study, if you like, that he was doing. And um, there were those without that had said, listen, your your mother and your your brothers, your biological brothers are out there. They want to see you. So then Jesus looks around on those who are with him at his teaching, and he says, Behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. So here again, just, just generally, there's a scripture where Jesus is saying it's those who do the will of God who he regards as part of him. So therefore, you know, showing it's pretty important to know the will of God. And just another one. Colossians 4, verse 12, Paul writes there, Caphras greets you, he being of you, a servant of Christ, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So here was a brother, an apostle, Epaphras, constantly and fervently praying for the believers that they would stand perfect in the will of God. So, you know, that just lays the foundation. Yes, we can know the will of God. We should be asking what the will of God is. And there's a few scriptures just showing the blessings and how important the will of God is for us. Are there different categories of God's will for our life? Yes, I would divide the will of God into two, two main categories. And those two are the general will of God, which would apply to, to any person. And secondly, the specific will of God. And that will be different depending on um, who, who you are. Proverbs 16 verse 9 says, A person plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So what we want to do is look at those two categories and just sort of uh, try and beam in a little bit more on the part that we have to play for, for finding that, that will in both those areas. Okay, please explain then firstly about how we should find the general will of God in our life. Yeah, so so let's look at, at that. Uh, the will of God that would apply to all. Um, again, just a few scriptures showing some of the things that God would will us to be doing as his people. Firstly, Ephesians 6 Verses five and six says, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. Now, obviously, in these days, um, a lot of Christians were slaves, it says servants, but it really just means slaves. They were they were slaves to their masters. Um, it's not quite the same, but I think we can apply the same principle to those of us who are employees, because effectively it is like a sort of a servant master relationship so we should you know be applying that in our life so it says there to be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart 
as unto Christ. It's saying, listen, work for your employer as if you are working for the Lord. And then it says, not with eye service, not being a man pleaser, but as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. So this is a general principle whereby if we're working um, for somebody, we are to be working for them as if we're doing it for the Lord and that is God's will for us. So that's a, a general principle for us all to be following. First Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says, for this is the will of God, even your sanctification. It's a big word. It just been, means being made clean, being regarded as clean, not, not sinful. So God's will is for our sanctification that we should abstain from fornication. So again, a general principle that we all should seek to follow. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Again, general principle for us all that in everything we give thanks. That's the will of God. It's not a suggestion. <laughs> it's the will of God. 1 Peter 2 verses 13 through to 15 says, then be in obedience, be in obedience to every creation of man because of the Lord, whether it's the king as being supreme, to governors as through him having indeed being sent for vengeance on evildoers, a praise on well-doers, because so is the will of God doing good to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Now, you've got to realize when Peter was writing these words, in the first century christians were suffering they were slaves they were suffering a lot of persecution from not only the the romans but also from the jewish leaders and christians are being told to do good to come under to be obedient even to these these rulers and there's another scripture that says listen you know if you suffer um, for being an evildoer then blessed are you so again this is the will of god that we're not always trying to fight to get out of every bad situation, but we accept and thank God in them all. And Hebrews 10 verse 36 says, For you have need of patience, that having done the will of God, you may obtain the promise. So again here, patience is a part of God's will for us so that we make it to the end and we obtain the promises. Now, there's obviously a lot of scriptures instructing us to do this and to do that. I've just chosen some which specifically mention that phrase, the will of God. But it, it gives you a general principle by which if you're going to believe in God, you have to follow these things. They're not specific to just one person or another. These are general principles for all, all believers. And now perhaps a part of God's will, we will all want to really know and find the hardest to answer his personal will for me. Right. So you now I want to get into the nitty gritty because you know if you read the Bible, if you're a Christian, it's it's a bit of a no brainer. You know generally what God requires of you, but this is the tricky one, isn't it? This is the one we get hung up on and we get frustrated about. But what is the specific will of God for me? Well, I would say this, first of all, forget about that. Forget about asking God or even thinking about God's specific will for you if you're not trying to apply the general will for you. And by that, I mean God will not unfold the specific will for you if you haven't shown that you can be dedicated generally to his general will. OK, so that's the that's the first thing I would say um, Too many Christians, especially young Christians. We get so focused. Oh, what am I supposed to be doing? What what God what's God's will for me specifically? Whereas they haven't even actually got out of the starting blocks yet as far as just learning to obey, learning to have patience, learning to be thankful. You know, all of those general principles that we've just looked at. So I would say, first of all, knuckle down and get those general principles in focus, all right? Now, none of us are going to be perfect. We're all, all going to fail, but God is going to know. He's going to be monitoring you. No one else needs to. 
but he is going to know if you are serious about applying those general principles that we've talked about. Now, once you've done that, the and, and actually just to back that up, I've got a scripture here, Romans 12 verse 2, says, don't be conformed to this world, but continually be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may be able, able to determine what God's will is, what is proper, pleasing, and perfect. So you see here, Paul is writing saying, don't be conformed to the world. You know, get those general principles of obedience and sanctification and holiness under your belt so that you can then determine what is the will of God, you see? And that will of God clearly is not the general will of God because that doesn't need to be determined. That, that's a given. The scriptures are very clear. You know, be obedient, be thankful, be patient, etc. But what he's talking about here is you will then be able to determine to find out, to know what is the specific will of God for you, all right? So do that first. Get get the general will, will of God in focus. Now, everyone's calling, everyone's gifting, everyone's ministry, it's going to be specific to you. Even if you have the same ministry as somebody else, it's still going to be different. It's like that parable of the seed sown in the ground. The fruitful ground, produce some 30, some 60, some 100. Different, you see? Same, might have been the same ministry, but different fruitfulness. So, and, he, and the Bible actually says that in Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 12. It says, truly, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of his ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we all have different ministries, different callings. God will have given that to you, but it's all for one purpose, for the perfecting and the building up of the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 puts it this way from verse 4. There are differences of gifts, but it's the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but it's the same Lord. There are differences of workings, but it's the same God working all things in all. And of course, in that chapter in 1 Corinthians, Paul uses the analogy of the body. It's one body. It's all working together, but some are fingers, some are toes, some are lungs, some are bones, some are blood cells, you know, some are eyes, some are ears, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that is the way it is to be um, in the body of Christ. Now, Paul says in Romans 1 verse 10, always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. So for Paul, the will of God for him was that he was to be a sojourner, someone who journeyed around, an apostle, an evangelist, traveled around from here to there. But that doesn't mean that is the gift for all of us. Um, he goes on in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1 to say, Paul, a called apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God. So you can see Paul is making it clear he was called by God. So that's the first thing to think about as far as your specific will of God in your life. It is God who is going to call you to this. All right. Now, just like a covenant, we talk about a covenant, our covenant with God. It is two way. God does something. We have to do something in return. In the same way, um, applying the will of God, it is also two-way, but it starts with God's calling, and then it follows up with our obedience to that. James 4 verse 8 says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So if you're asking, oh, you know, what is the will of God, the specific will for my life? Remember that. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you, and he will start revealing to you what the will for you is. And of course, ask him. Ask him. Sometimes we get all stewed up and frustrated trying to work out, you know, what, what's the will of God for my life? And we're thinking, is it this? Is it that? And should I do this? And you know what? We haven't even asked God, the giver and the caller, 
of the will on our life. James 1.5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, and we might say, you know, if any of you don't know what is the will of God for your life, then ask God. He gives to all men liberally. He doesn't rebuke and it shall be given to you. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. How do we get to know God's personal and specific will for our life? Right. So having having thought about that, let's now zero in a little bit more specifically and, and give you some tools to help you accomplish this. Well, first of all, I like the scripture in Isaiah 40, verse 31, and it says, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's a beautiful picture of ministry, performing the will of God in a believer's life, rising up like eagles, running, not being weary. It's, it's a beautiful picture of that. Now, the word wait there, but they that wait upon the Lord. Um, it's one of those unfortunate translations, which has lost really the meaning of it. You know, it makes it sound like we're just waiting waiting, waiting, twiddling our thumbs. Well, you know, I'll just sit here on my on my armchair and just wait, wait, wait for God. That's not what it means. The word wait there literally is a, a Hebrew word which means to entwine like strands of rope. So it's saying those who are entwined like a rope with the Lord, they shall rise up, they shall run. So focus on that. Make your will God's will. Become as one with him as you can. So that's that's the first thing to do. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, that he may give you your heart's desire. Make the Lord your number one desire. And again, having done that, God will be able to build his will on that. There's... um. In, in the literal, again, the literal translation of that of that verse, rather than saying delight yourself, it's a Hebrew word which means to roll, to roll upon. And one translation renders it this way, roll your way upon the Lord, trust in him, and he will work. And commentators believe this is a picture of how a camel would be made to sit down and they would roll quite sometimes heavy loads, they would roll the load onto the camel. And then, of course, the camel would stand up and, and carry the load. So in, in the literal Hebrew, it's telling us to do that, to roll ourselves onto the Lord. Let him carry all of our burdens, and then he will work. He will give us our heart's desire. In John, John chapter 10 it says, the one entering through the door is the shepherd. It's talking about Jesus. He's the shepherd of the sheep. The doorkeeper opens to him, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, as a young Christian, just a question that's often asked, which goes hand in hand with this question, you know, what's the will of God for my life? Another question similar to that is, well, I'm a sheep. How do I know? How do I know when I hear the shepherd's voice? How do I know when Jesus talks to me? Well, you know, this is a an agricultural picture, especially of the Middle East, where the sheep would know the voice of the shepherd by experience. And that is the key word here, by experience. When you get more experienced in the Lord, you have learnt what it is. You've probably made a few mistakes as well, assumed the Lord spoke to you and it wasn't. But through that experience, you get to know when the Lord is speaking to you. And like that sheep, you can then move and do because you know the Lord has spoken to you. But what if you're a young Christian? What if you're an inexperienced Christian and you haven't yet learned that skill? Well, you do what the lambs do. You do what the young sheep do. And what's that? They follow the sheep. 
right? They follow their mothers. If they've just been born, they've never heard the, the voice of the shepherd. They don't know whether this guy is dangerous or, or looks after them. But what do they do? They trust their mother. They trust the older sheep, and so they follow them. And it is a, a beautiful analogy, especially for the young Christian. If you don't quite know when the Lord is speaking to you, then follow the older sheep. Follow the more experienced Christians who do know the voice of the Lord. And in John 15, verse 16, and this, this is going to be, for me, the, the theme scripture of our message today. John, John 15, verse 16 says, you, this is Jesus speaking, you have not chosen me, but I chose you and I planted you that you should go and bear fruit and your fruit remain. That whatever you should ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. This is a beautiful scripture because again, our relationship with the Lord is a two-way thing, right? Um, God does so-and-so, we have to react. But Jesus is reminding us here, listen, it wasn't our initiative to choose the Lord. We answered the call. Jesus chose us first. And so the point here is, if Jesus has chosen you, don't you think he's smart enough, having chosen you, to fulfill his purpose in you? You have been a Christian for 42 years, John. Can you share with us your testimony on this? Yeah, I, I thought I would like to just share some of my own experience, which hopefully will sort of help on, on this issue, especially talking about the specific will for your life. Because um, in the place I am now, um, I've found my ministry. Um, I've found my the, the will of God for me in my life. I mean, that may change, but for now, found my ministry and the will of God. And I just want to share with you just just briefly without being too long-winded how that has come about and, and hopefully that will help um, others of you. The first mistake I made when I was a young Christian was comparing myself with others. Bad mistake. And the Bible actually says in 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12, do not compare yourselves for comparing yourselves with others, you're not wise, all right? Don't do that. And what I did as a young Christian, I looked at, for example, um, Brother Barry, and he had a he had a library full of Christian books, and he knew the word so well, and I didn't, so you can't, you can't do that. And there were people in our fellowship who were very practical, a builder, a mechanic, and they would be fixing people's cars, um, you know, because that was that was their gifting. There were musicians. I wasn't musical, so I couldn't couldn't do that. And to be honest, I felt a bit useless. Okay, I was a, I was a young Christian, and I, I shouldn't have felt that way, but I did. And I was comparing myself to this person and that person, and thinking, well, I can't do anything. You know, I'm I'm, I'm useless, and it's a bit depressing. So I just said to myself, well. I'm useless, can't do anything, but at least I can get to know God's word. What an insult to God's word. Eh? <laughs> sort of looking at looking at it as almost a consolation prize. You know, you can't do anything else worthwhile, but oh, you can get to know God's word. Like that's a nothing. But please forgive me, I was a I was an ignorant young, young Christian. So anyway, I said to myself, Well, at least I can get to know God's word. That that's a good thing. And it's something. Well, so that's what I started doing. I faithfully started doing the daily reading chart, getting to know the word. Um, in those days, Barry's books were, were big, thick, full skate, full scat size books. So I went through all his theses, getting to know the scriptures, getting to know our, our doctrine. And so having got to know that, then I thought, ah, I think I could I could just give a little talk. First talk I ever gave in church was 10 minutes, and it was on James 5, 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And in that little talk, I'd just gone into Strong's Concordance. Um, we use eSword now on our laptops, but in those days, big, big book, you know, this thick um, was the equivalent. 
looked up the different words, the effectual, the fervent, um, availeth, and just gave a little talk on some of the literal words, compared a few scriptures with other scriptures. Very short talk. But it was based, that talk was able to be done because I'd started getting to know God's word. Well, really, it, it just went from there because the more I got to know God's word, uh, the more talks I was able to do. I, I became fervent about wanting to give talks, so gave more and more talks. And after quite a few years, okay, there's a, a little ministry developing. But after a number of years, and I would, I think this was about 2007, so it was about 17 years ago, I just got an, I describe it as an urgency in my spirit. Um, when you experience it, you will know. And maybe some of you have on, on different things or in the Lord. It's a feeling of, I must do this. I want to do this. I must do this. I describe it as an urgency in my spirit. And because, as we just said, the Lord has chosen us. So therefore, he's going to be directing you. This is of the spirit, just causing you to have a strong desire to do this. I got an urgency in my spirit to do mission work. Now, we're a small church. We don't have branches all over the world. Um, we didn't have an international mission ministry. So anyway, I was sharing this with Barry, our pastor. And he said, well, contact a guy called Duncan Heaster. You know, he believes what we believe. And he does a lot of mission work around the world. So sent him off an email saying, I'm John, you know, I want to do mission work. And he said, well, we're in Latvia. We're doing a lot of work in Eastern Europe at the moment. You're welcome to come across and just see what we do. So two years later, 2009, I did that, went to see Duncan, um, met him, and then he gave us opportunities to visit Africa and other places. And it's like anything, you don't know what you don't know. But once you get taught something, you then start developing skills on how to do. It's the same in life, whether you're learning to build, learn to cook, learn to sew, learning to teach, whatever. You have to be taught. And so Duncan was able to teach me certain things about you know, the ministry and that sort of thing. And praise God, um, God um, also gave me Brother Guy, who was very passionate as well about the mission work. So the two of us sort of teamed up and um, it just went from there. We just started doing more mission work to different places. And so now, of course, since um, COVID, we've done Zoom ministry, the online Zoom church has developed, which is an extension of that. And here we are today. So God has revealed his specific will for me. That that's my ministry, doing this um, Bible teaching um, and, and this sort of work. Founded, founded on getting to know his word. So I would say that to all of you. And, and again, remember, we talked general and general principles. That is a general principle for all Christians. It's the glory of God, Proverbs 25 verse 2 says, to conceal a word. And it's the honor of kings. Remember, we are kings and priests. It's the honor of kings to search out the word. So I would say this to you. Get to know God's word as much as you can. Read it. Study it. Read books about it. Okay, you can eat the meat, spit out the bones. If some of those books, you know, aren't according to the truth. But get to know God's word. And then there is a rich foundation for God to build ministry upon that. Now, for a lot of us, we may never become evangelists. That's certainly not my major skill. Um, I regard myself as a, as a Bible teacher, not so much an evangelist. But the Bible says, you know, it's a body ministry. But be that as it may, God has done that for me based on getting to know his word and then adding his will by giving me that sense of urgency to open a door, meeting Duncan, and then, of course, it, it just went went from there as God directed. So, you know, your, your walk for all of you is going to be different, but the same. It's You're going to be able to tell a, a different story than what I've just um, told you, but it's going to be the same 
in the sense it's going to be based, it's going to be founded on you knowing God's word and being faithful to him. So hopefully there's there's some sort of um, element that you can take out of that that will help as well. Many experiencing finding God's specific will for their life difficult, frustrating, and discouraging. How can we prevent this? Yeah, so finally, I've been through this. Some of you may have gone through this. Some of you may be going through this now if you're a young Christian. It is it is a frustrating thing, especially especially when you you love God and you want to do more. This, this is one of the frustrating things for me I can remember. Um, I remember thinking, you know, Brother Barry's had a couple of hundred odd baptisms and and he's taught hundreds of people the truth and whatever, whatever. You know, I want to have more to show. I want to have more to be able to give to the Lord when when he comes. And that's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good thing, as long as it's not motivated by ego or pride. But it's a good thing to want to do more for God. So rather, though, than letting yourself get frustrated at your perceived, and I would say your self-perceived lack, because you're in God, He's got you exactly where he wants to wants to have you if, if you're being obedient. So rather than getting frustrated, just focus, bring, bring you back, focus on the general will of God. Just examine ourselves and say, right, am I being obedient? Am I being faithful in these general areas where I can be in my relationship with God? Because that's clear. That is clear and easy. It's not hard to read God's word and see those general principles, right? Then, as I've said, you can become prepared and able to be used for God, for him to uncover the will for you personally. Luke 22, verse 42, one of these foundational principles that we have to, to get under our belt is where Jesus says, Father, if it be willing, remove this cup from me. He didn't want he didn't want to be crucified. There's going to be a painful experience. But he goes on to say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So that's a foundational principle on, I think, escaping from this frustration of finding God's will. Just come to that place, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And then in Luke 9, 23, Jesus said to them, if any will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So again, this will take the frustration out of this because it's a general principle, and we must come to this place where it's not our will. We've taken upon us the, the principle of the cross, and then we're more able, we're ready for God to use us. I'd also say this, don't second guess God. Don't demand or assume what he should do. I'll tell you another, another little testimony. Um, I'd been unemployed for about four and a half years. And financially, it was getting a bit tough for us to even sort of pay the mortgage. And um, I cried out to the Lord sort of in a more desperate way for a, for a good job. And very shortly after that, a job was advertised for an office manager. And historically, I'm just a pen pusher. I'm you know, just a guy working in an office. So this job was an office manager working at a private school very close to where we live. And we, we live out in the country, so we're, we're out of town, not easy to get places. So this was a quarter of an hour away, private school, office manager. It ticked all my boxes, close geographically good job, exactly what I'm, I'm able to do. So I thought, oh, this looks like it's of the Lord. So I applied for this job, got shortlisted to the last two. I thought, this is God. Uh, this is mine. Guess what? Didn't get the job. Now, again, I'm embarrassed to say, but I was angry with God. And I can't remember exactly, but I probably said these words to God. But God, you, know, you gave me this job. This was my job. But it wasn't. It wasn't the job for me. And so I learned, listen, don't assume, even if 
things may look like, oh, yes, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be going there. That can sometimes just be a test. But God is teaching us not to assume on what God should do. Well, i got to say the story ends well, though, because within a couple of weeks after that, um, a brother in our church was working for a company. They were growing. They needed somebody else. So he recommended me. I got that job, started off at the bottom, um, ended up traveling overseas with that company, getting a very good salary, company car, you know, enabled us to pay off our mortgage, ended up working for that family for 13 years before I ended up um, working for, for myself now. So, you know, what appeared to be a major disappointment in my life at the time, God was teaching me a lesson, but then blessing me with what his will really was within a couple of weeks after that. So, you know, in finding the will of God, don't get so desperate that you make the mistake of assuming or demanding of God. And I'd say this, if you're unsure, again, maybe you're a younger Christian, maybe you don't have anyone around to perhaps give you a bit of counsel, and you've got options, and you feel you've got to make a decision to, to do something, and should I do this, should I go there? If you're not sure, if you're not sure, stick with the status quo. And just to explain in case you don't understand what I mean, don't change anything. Because if you make a decision that's a bad decision, it could work out badly for you. So what I'm saying is when it's God's will, it will be the right thing to do. You will get that sense that it is and he will ensure that it is. But sometimes we want a certain thing. We either lack patience or we actually secretly want to do something that actually we're not talking to God about that he doesn't, and we make bad decisions. If you're not sure, then I call it the status quo principle. Don't change anything. You can't be any worse off if you just stay right where you are, right? And remember John 15. He called you. He chose you. He's an intelligent God. Don't worry. He's going to put you exactly where he wants you to be. Now, God will never force our free will. We have free will. But be available. Be available. There's a proverb, Proverbs 3.27, that says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due, when it is in the power of your hand to do it. In other words, let, let's say the Good Samaritan, for example, right? You all know that story. The man had been beaten, left for dead, and it was the Samaritan who ended up helping him. He had the ability to help someone. Now, we didn't walk past the beaten man and say, oh, is this God's will that I help this man or not? He knew as a general principle, yes, and so you may not have a specific ministry ongoingly as a church teacher or an evangelist or a musician or whatever, but when opportunities arise and you have the ability to work for God, maybe a one-off little mission trip like, you know, Renee has just done recently, or to help someone who may be struggling with their finances at the moment might be you only do it once it's not your main ministry but you do it once proverbs here is saying listen if it's in your power of your hand to do it do it always be ready and prepared to do good don't sort of wait oh you know i'm waiting i'm waiting for my real permanent ministry often ministry is just very short term and here and there so be prepared for that and finally today i want to leave you with a scripture isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 and, of course, Isaiah was a prophet, or he was certainly about to become a prophet when we read this verse. Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? The Lord's asking that of everybody, especially those of us who believe. He's saying, Whom shall I send? Who, who will go and represent me? And what did Isaiah say? It says, then said I, 
here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. So when we talk about the specific will of God, it's going to be different for you all. You're all going to have a different ministry to a greater or a lesser degree, depending on which part of God's body you're in. The important thing is that you've got the same attitude as Isaiah, and you can say to the Lord, Lord, send me. And it's not necessarily, oh, send me overseas to Africa to be a missionary and live there for the rest of my life. It can be just, Lord, send me to help in the church ministry by putting the flowers there this morning. Or, Lord, send me to that brother or that sister that's sick and, and is living alone and with a meal. And I mean, I could multiply the options for you, you know, many, many fold. You, you know where I'm heading. There are all sorts of things, all sorts of things we can accomplish individually in the Lord. And if we have that attitude to the Lord, Lord, send me, and you are making an effort to apply these other general principles we've talked about of getting to know his word, being obedient, being patient, um, not assuming on God, and you're preparing yourself there, you're listening for the voice of the Lord, you're consulting counselors, the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there is safety, but talk to the older sheep, you know, the more experienced Christians get their advice, get their knowledge, then you will find you can become more and more useful for the master. So, you know, that probably won't answer every jot and tittle of the subject, but hopefully it helps for those of us, especially young Christians, looking to try and find this will of God. And again, just finally, the, the theme scripture, John 15, verse 16, don't forget, don't forget, the Lord chose you first. And he's not stupid.